All right, let's go ahead and get started. Good good evening, everyone. My name is Megan Marino. I'm uh, with the Alameda County Water District, and you are here um, for our landscape workshop, Alternative to Lawns, in partnership with uh, Alameda County Water District and the Bay Area Water Supply and Conservation Agency with the guest lecturer, Frank Nicoli. So thank you all for joining. I'll just go over a brief agenda, um, which will be a short background on ACWD and our partner agency, Bosca, and uh, presentation followed by Q&A. So all attendees are muted by default, but uh, the instructor will pause periodically for questions and questions are encouraged and there's multiple ways to ask. So you can either um, raise your hand and I'll keep an eye out for raised hands or type your question into the Q&A please avoid using the chat. We'll monitor the Q&A for questions. And then at the end, um, you can just raise your hand, you can come off mute. Um, there'll be more Q&A at the end. And this webinar is being recorded. So um, all the presentation materials and things like that will be on YouTube later. Short introduction for the Alameda County Water District. Um, it is our mission to provide a reliable supply of high quality water at a reasonable price for our customers. We have over 344,000 customers with 84,000 connections serving 105 square miles of Fremont, Newark, and Union City. And we were founded over 100 years ago, 110 years ago now, um, to protect the Niles Cone groundwater basin, which is one of our supplies. So in the pie chart, you can see our diverse supply portfolio. This is what makes up your drinking water if you live in the service area. And 40% um, of that is the Alameda Creek watershed runoff, which we consider local supplies. So that includes the Niles Cone groundwater basin, um, water that's pumped out of the groundwater um, or runoff from the Alameda Creek uh, River, as well as the state water project. So Lake Orville supplies um, coming from the Sierras. We purchased some of that as, and the final um, wedge in our supply portfolio is uh, purchased from the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission, which comes from the Hetch Hetchery area in um, Yosemite. We offer several programs um, that we wanna make sure you're all aware of, especially as it relates to landscape um, and outdoor irrigation. That's one of the best ways to save so um, we offer water conservation kits, turf replacement rebates, so you get $2 per square foot if you convert your lawn to water efficient landscaping. We provide these landscape workshops, which you're all a part of. For income qualified customers, we do um, have uh, direct install programs for energy and water and um, irrigation hardware rebates. So if you're thinking of upgrading any of your system pop-ups, uh, spray nozzles, things like that, you can get a rebate if you pick the most efficient products. We have one of our new programs is a residential DIY home water use survey, DIY do-it-yourself. And that is uh, you answer a series of questions about your home and your fixtures, and you get a customized report based on what you input. And we um, provide a report that says how you can save and actually provide devices to you based on uh, your answer. So if you have an inefficient shower head, we see that in the survey results, we'll go ahead and send you an efficient shower head. So really great to take advantage of that. And also weather-based irrigation controllers, rain barrel rebates, all of that. So I will be just putting my contact info if anyone is interested in these rebates, we encourage you to take advantage of them. A little bit about our partner agency, Bosca makes up the 26 agencies that purchase SFPUC water, San Francisco, uh, Public Utilities Commission or San Francisco Regional Water System. That um, you can see in the map is a lot of the Bay Area. And uh, if you recall, I mentioned that uh, a portion of our supplies come from San Francisco and that's what connects us to Bosca. And um, so overall they serve 1.8 million people, 40,000 businesses in three different counties. And they have a very similar goal, which is to provide high quality supply of water at a fair price. There's many more upcoming workshops um, with topics including pruning, gardening design, increasing habitat gardens, irrigation controller programming, edible gardens, 
Um, these are both on a mixture of online and in person. So um, you can go to bosca.org slash conserve slash programs slash classes and sign up for additional ones going, I think all the way into June or May or June. Um, there's a lot of opportunities for learning. So today we'll learn about outdoor, how outdoor water use um, can be conserved because it represents one of the single largest untapped opportunity for conservation in the Bay Area. And um, the second program objective is that outdoor water use reduction through the use of water efficient plants and innovative techniques can help conserve water and ensure that future water supplies are, uh, meet the needs of our communities. Just a quick disclaimer, um, this is this talk, this presentation is um, meant to be general in nature and is not ex intended to be an exhaustive review. What's said is not necessarily reflect the policies of ACWD or BOSCA, they're that of the instructors, and um, the materials used are provided as a courtesy and are not endorsed by um, BOSCA or ACWD. One quick announcement, um, really exciting opportunity uh, for our service area for um, on May 11th, so upcoming, we're offering a behind the scenes tour of our water treatment plant. This is, um, space is limited. So if you're interested, go ahead and scan the QR code and be sure to sign up. It's really cool to see how and what goes into cleaning the water before it's distributed into our pipes. Here is our contact information. I'll also put it in the chat. Um, but feel free to reach out to us at any time. Um, we really encourage water conservation, rain or shine, drought or no drought, you know, conservation is important so we can extend our supplies as far as possible. So without further ado, let me um, introduce our award-winning lecturer for this evening, Frank Nickley. He has degrees in horticulture from Cal Poly and the College of San Mateo. Um, and UCSF or USF. He has several professional services um, certifications and donates his time to be um, a contractor uh, and president, board member, and chairman for several companies, including the California Landscape Contractors Association, Association of Professional Landscape Designers, and Environmental Sustainability Task Force. You can see his large list of awards, which we're really lucky to have because um, he will be sharing all of his knowledge and skills over 55 years of gardening. Uh, and beyond that, he is an educator, researcher, poet, and chef. So without further ado, we'll have Frank uh, take over the share screen and get this going on the lecture portion. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, you can see my screen? Yes. Outstanding. All right. So let's uh, talk about uh, lawn. So when we talk about lawns or any kind of plant material, it's all about the inputs versus the outputs. The inputs are, of course, solar energy, precipitation, nutrients, uh, rain, um, dust, believe it or not, and atmospheric carbon dioxide. And these inputs are important when we talk about complex systems. So this is a complex system. It's not a monoculture. It is a, a very di diverse system. And the um, Biological diversity of this system uh, provides clean water, reduces global warming, removes carbon dioxide for the atmosphere. It has no real impact on municipal landfills. It doesn't have any impact on fossil fuel supplies uh, or temperate forests. It's, uh, it's a relatively stable uh, system. It does... Um, um, uh, store carbon, whereas this kind of system is very simple. The um, outputs are much higher than the inputs. Uh, you need fossil fuel to uh, mow this thing. 
Uh, you need fertilizers. One pound of a nitrogen-based fertilizer takes one gallon of diesel. So the um, the system doesn't work in comparison to this complex system. So we're going to talk about how to get rid of this stuff. So before we go further, let's talk about turf versus lawn. So this is turf. Sports fields are considered turf. This loosely is considered a lawn. It's a broader term. It describes mowed vegetation containing uh, broadleaf plants as well as um, dicots or grass. So when we talk about lawn, we want it to be sustainable. We, we want it to be built around a species with a specific set of characteristics. And it has to have the ability to survive over time. It has to um, maintain adequate densities with modest amounts of water and fertilizer. Obviously, this one isn't. It needs to uh, be built around a specific set of characteristics. It needs to survive drought stress, and most turf cannot. It needs to have minimum of insect and disease problems, and turf does not. Um, it produces a manageable amount of, of thatch. Um, because it takes a lot of fossil fuel energy to get this stuff out. And sustainable lawns uh, need to be built around a, a specific set of characteristics. It theoretically should blend well with other grasses and dicots. We'll talk about uh, that in just a moment. So even though perennial rye has the highest fertility uh, requirements. It is a perfect grass to use with dicots. So if you do have a perennial Y rye, stop fertilizing it and don't water it anymore, and mix it with drought tolerant plants. So this is this is my my first and not best alternative to lawns. So when we look at lawns in general, not turf, we found that there were anywhere from 83 to 139 plant species that were found in homeowner lawns. And Oregon State did the um, study on this. This is one of the ones they found in lawns. It's very drought tolerant. It will go dormant in a prolonged dry period, but Bellus perennis mixed with your lawn, and you can overseed this, <laughs> with Bellus perennis, and it'll make it more drought tolerant. Achillea, great choice. Many colors, paprika, which is orange-red, calistoga, which is white, cerise queen, vivid pink, uh, island pink, which is pink, red beauty, obviously red, white beauty, white fire king is red, and lilac beauty is lavender. So you can get Numerous colors of Achillea. This is another one. You can overseed an existing lawn and it will substitute for lawn. Trifolium for, uh, uh, for fragiferum uh, is a dense, low growing plant. It's shorter than white clover, but the plant blends very well with a drought tolerant uh, type of turf. Uh, trifolium is also very drought tolerant. Um, the flowers do attract bees, so if you do have some uh, uh, allergy issues, this may not be a great choice. This is a uh, gallium, and this is the most drought tolerant or drought resistant of all of the plants that I've shown you so far. It's very compatible with grasses. It does spread by rhizomes, but it is not aggressive. It uh, produces yellow flowers in the spring. Um, this one was uh, used in the past to stuff uh, mattresses um, because it acts like a flea repellent. Um, so that's what they what uh, first peoples used to uh, use this for <coughs> keep the fleas away. Uh, this is another very tough plant. This is uh, self heal or prunella. It's very drought tolerant. It forms these dense patches. Uh, produces these purple flowers at mowing height if you're mowing. It's edible. Um, it's in the uh, Laminaceae family or the pea family. 
If you've got a wet or shade area, then these are the plants that'll work. This is glaucoma, um, very uh, tough uh, plant. Uh, foliage is somewhat coarse, but it blends very well with grasses. It uh, It is a, um, a very beautiful flowering plant, stays pretty low. Ranunculus is another nice one. You see it mixed in with um, grasses in this particular picture. It's um, a moderate shade tolerant plant. It's a vigorous uh, spreader. And the um, plant is uh, easy to grow. The uh, Veronica, another tough plant, uh, performs very well in wet areas and shady areas, uh, stays low growing at all times and produces blue flowers, spreads by um, stolons, and it uh, it's quite, quite uh, pretty. So in terms of broad applications, chamomile blends quite well with grasses, uh, comes from the Greek for earth apple because of its apple-like scent. This is oxalis. It's a, a herbaceous perennial. Mix, uh, mixes very well with grasses, produces yellow and white flowers. Does very well in deep shade and under trees with limited root zones, uh, especially uh, under and near redwoods. So sustainable lawns need to blend well with other grasses and dicots. They need to have the ability to persist over time. They need to maintain adequate densities with modest inputs of water and fertilizer. They need to survive significant drought stress, and they need to produce manageable amounts of thatch. So those of, uh, those of you who may have lawns, you might find it surprising that the Constitution does not dictate that we need to have a lawn. It's not in the Constitution. Lawns are high maintenance. They need extremely uh, high amounts of water, fertilizer, frequent mowing. They're expensive. And quite frankly, I find lawns disappointing. Yet people love lawns. If you're Thinking low maintenance or no maintenance, this is what a low maintenance landscape looks like. This is actually, there is maintenance here, uh, but this is, this is what a low maintenance landscape would typically look like. This is an extremely high maintenance landscape. This is Bouchard Gardens. They have 85 full-time gardeners um, in their high season to maintain Bouchard. So there's a there's a um uh, a deep um there's a long way from this to this. When I was a landscape contractor I always got well we we want to put a lawn in for the kids. The kids like to play on the lawn. Well that's a misconception. Kids don't need a lawn. They like to play in the soil. They're curious. They like touching and exploring soil. They like getting dirty. So why have them play on a lawn with chemicals? They they just don't like it. Um, so we need to get rid of these lawns and create a low maintenance garden. If nothing else, let's put it in for the kids so that they can explore. Children's favorite places are not um, under our noses, they want to. They want to hide. They don't want to be seen. So they want to play out in the in uh, in the landscape. They want to touch flowers. They want to smell them. They want to play with them. They um, like the the beauty of the flowers. So there is a real misconception that they need a lawn to play on. If you think taking out your lawn will make you the weird one on the block. It's not that extreme. Um, taking out this person's lawn didn't make him the weird one on the block. That's for certain. Anybody know whose house this is? See the apple on the fence? Yep. Mr. Jobs' house. He was smart enough not to have a lawn. He had a very diverse landscape, a lot of fruit trees, a lot of low maintenance uh, plant material up in the front. Um, and so we, um, yeah. Anyway, 
so much for theory. Let's talk about some facts and nothing but the facts. So I'm going to show you two different kinds of landscapes. I'm going to show you um, a typical landscape, and I'm going to show you a, a sustainable landscape. When we talk about the characteristics for these particular um, plants, we're going to be talking about water usage, pests, and diseases. We're going to talk about um, some certain definitions, the design type, pests and diseases, water usage. And I want to talk about the typical landscape first. So a typical landscape is plants that are customary or popular to include in the landscape. They're usually high maintenance. They're usually high water use. They need optimum environmental conditions. They're more susceptible to insects and diseases, and they're non-natives. These are typically what you get at the big box stores. So this is a really good business plan. You buy the plants at big box, and then you got to buy the chemicals to fix the plants at big box. If you want to know a typical plant palette, well, this is it. Ajuga, Agapanthus, Akuba. Choicea, hibiscus, hydrangeas, ilexes, which are hollies, photinias, pitosporums, rhododendrons, betulas, ginkgos, ophipogum, and annuals, and turf. This is a typical plant list that many people put into their landscapes. And on the sustainable side, we're defining that as plants that are native, they're lower maintenance, lower water use, they're more sustainable, they're less susceptible to insects and diseases. Here is a typical plant list for the sustainable. Look at this list and tell me, do you know more on this list or on the typical plant list? And most people say, I know more on the, on the typical plant list than the sustainable plant list. We're gonna address this. Let's talk about pest comparison. In the typical landscape, there's a total of 13 different plants. 11 out of the 13 were susceptible to pests. 10 out of the 13 were susceptible to diseases. 13 pests and six diseases were identified for annuals. 10 pests and 14 diseases were identified for turf. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in just a minute. On the sustainable side, total of 20 plants. Five out of the 20 were susceptible to plants. Five out of the 20 were susceptible to diseases. 14 out of the 20 were resistant to both pests and the diseases. Growth conditions were evaluated. Low maintenance, low water, drought tolerance, and easy to grow. The typical landscape had two out of 12 that had one or more of these conditions, where the sustainable garden had 18 of 20 that had um, one or more of these conditions. So low maintenance, low water, drought tolerance, and easy to grow. Here's your comparison in terms of dollars. These gardens were actually built so they could evaluate that. I'm gonna show you pictures of, of these gardens in, in just a minute, but I wanna talk about the dollars and cents. So the sustainable garden costs $1,500 to design. Typical garden was $1,500. Demolition was $4,100 versus $2,900. And I'll explain this number in a minute. Soil prep, much higher for the sustainable. Irrigation was much lower by 1,000. Um, boulders, bender board went into the sustainable at 3,100. They put an infiltration pit in here so that the water stayed on site which is a good thing. They put in permeable paving. That jerked the price up because they wanted that water to percolate into the aquifer. The landscape area was 1,998 square feet in comparison to 1879, and the cost per square foot was $11.06 in comparison to $7.50. So you need to look at these numbers in a long-term um, dollars and cents view. Yes, the sustainable garden was more expensive to install, but at the long term, it's going to be much more uh, reasonable to manage in terms of time and dollars. I'm gonna show you those figures in just a minute. 
Now I'm going to show you some some um, some fantastic pictures of these gardens. And if you feel like you need to emote when the picture comes up, please do. Just ooh, are you ready? Here we go. Ooh. Yeah, this is the typical garden. It happens to be in Santa Monica, and they got two um, houses side by side. This happens to be a police station in a neighborhood. And they put this one in um, there because they found two uh, homes side by side that the city could work with. Fantastic landscape, isn't it? Just um, stunning. Let's look at it, what it costs to maintain this thing. 57,000 gallons of water in a year, 670 pounds of yard waste, 80 hours of maintenance. Now I'm going to show you the sustainable garden. And again, if you feel like you need to emote, emote. Ooh. Yep, that's what it looks like. But this is a nicer picture. 6,000 gallons of water, 250 uh, pounds of yard waste, and 15 hours of maintenance. Which one do you want? 80 hours of maintenance, 670 pounds of yard waste, and 57,000 gallons of water? Or this? So these were test gardens. And they just wanted to see what it was going to cost to install them and maintain them over time so that they had real life data to share with people within their water district. They also did some uh, analysis on um, the money. The typical garden, uh, as we saw, was using a lot of water. If water was a nickel a gallon, um, you would save uh, about $2,088 on the sustain sustainable garden in comparison to the typical amount of water <clears throat> on the um, or on the uh, on the sustainable garden, you would save about two thousand dollars and quite a bit of water. So a lot of people are re re reluctant to remove their lawns. So when I was a contractor, we used to do what are called lawn reductions, where we would work with a client to reduce the amount of lawn. They still wanted a little patch maybe for the dog or the kids, even though kids don't really care about lawn. And so you can see these, this particular picture, same house. We took that ugly lawn out of the front and redid it. Reduced the amount of lawn in this particular uh, uh, project. So it was continuous lawn um, uh, front and back. And so we, removed uh, quite a bit of lawn, put in uh, some stunning plants. And don't worry, I'm going to give you names of these plants in just a bit. Um, this is another lawn reduction, removed it from the sidewalk all the way up to the house and put in some boulders and some uh, very drought tolerant and tough plants. Uh, and I think it's a lot prettier, in my opinion. And I'm sure you do too. Same garden, just another view. This particular project, uh, the lawn went all the way up to the steps. It was a typical backyard and they wanted uh, a patio space. So we took out the lawn, put in a brick patio, uh, reduced the lawn, I should say. And now they have a party place. Um, a much nicer landscape, in my opinion. It gives them a place uh, to gather and eat and um, play. They didn't take out all the lawn on this particular trip. Eventually, we did take out the entire uh, piece of lawn. I want to talk about sheet mulching. So if you do have a lawn and it's actively growing, um, I think uh, Alameda County will give you money to sheet mulch. Um, and essentially what you're doing is you are laying down cardboard on top of an existing lawn, and then you're bringing in chip 
And the chip is free, by the way. You can get uh, uh, chip uh, from chipdrop.com. Um, they'll bring you chip. These are arborists who are removing um, limbs and pruning and such. They chip it up. They have to pay to dump it. So instead of that, they'll bring it to you and dump it on site. Free. Doesn't cost a cent. You can dumpster dive for cardboard. You can go to REI or any bike shop and get cardboard free. And you can um, um, sheet mulch your um, lawn. It takes about three months uh, for the lawn to completely die. Um, so I recommend that if people are thinking about doing that, do it in June or July, because then you can take advantage of the fall planting season it takes less water for your plants to um, acclimate um, and it's a and your lawn will be dead by then um, a lawn is a dead space and doing something like this revives that lawn you, you can't you won't believe how beautiful your soil will be when you sheet mulch and then you begin planting this is also called lasagna uh, mulching because you're building up layers you're essentially doing this so you've got your turf down at the base here. You're putting down some compost um, and cardboard and then your chip. And then you're putting uh, plant material in, in, in the, into this landscape. You can put a drip system under this um, uh, and hide, uh, hide it with all your uh, mulch and your cardboard. If you happen to have this particular beast, this is Bermuda grass, you need to put a double layer of cardboard. A single layer won't wipe this out. You can tell if it's Bermuda grass with this helicopter-like seed head. <clears throat> so if you have this, a double layer of um, cardboard. <clears throat> I'm gonna show you some pictures of a friend of mine over in the East Bay. She's a landscape contractor and she was uh, doing this particular project. Uh, removing turf, sheet mulching, and planting. And again, if you want to emote on these pictures, I highly recommend it. So she's uh, cutting up cardboard, laying it out over the turf, and planting it. So all this was turf. She brought in rocks, boulders, all types of uh, pool plants and got rid of all of that turf. I think this is a much better look. I'll be showing you some before and afters in just a minute. <clears throat> this is what the garden looked at, uh, looked at uh, like after about seven months. Much better look. <clears throat> garden before and after. She put in a drip system. You can see the hose on the right side here. Drip system all through it. Put in a nice um, uh, flagstone walkway before and after. All this was turf. Before and after, same garden. All this stuff was dead, all this stuff was bad. It was just a, a big weed fest. And she came in and fixed it. Another shot of this. <clears throat> another picture of it all this was turf all this stuff down below was all turf took it all out another project they did built up some terraces took out all the turf brought in some rock brought in some great plants put in a new sidewalk rain gardens i'm going to talk a little bit about rain gardens People have misconceptions about rain gardens in that they look like this, and they don't. Essentially, what you're doing is you're cutting the curbs, allowing the rain to come into your uh, landscape, and a lot of cities are doing this now. Um, this is lower than the grade so that the water sits in here and it uh, allows these plants to acclimate. Rain gardens are a great way to um, establish a landscape using existing rainwater. So there is a uh, rain gutter right here. And what um, 
she did with this garden is she's moving water throughout the garden, put in a lot of succulents and a lot of tough plants, gave them a lot of texture, a lot of different colors. This is all uh, irrigated by rainwater and nothing else. Let's go one step further and look at this. In nature, you see rocks and berms everywhere. Rocks slow water down. They stop water, they direct water. And so you can use um, rock. So we piled up an old uh, lawn on top of this into a berm, brought in some rock and planted it. This is essentially turned into a rain garden. This was another all lawn. We uh, terraced this four levels or no, three levels. Put in a nice sitting area, brought in some interesting low um, maintenance, low water use plants. And this is much more interesting than the ugly lawn that they had previous. Beautiful um, stack wall, no mortar in this wall, it was all a uh, stack wall. It's another all lawn at one time, took it all out. Did a mix of California natives and some Mediterranean plants in this particular landscape. Again, Mediterranean plants in, in and amongst uh, California natives brought in some rock, brought in a lot of interest. Rocks themselves have a lot of interest. If you buy rock and they don't have all this beautiful stuff on them, take some moss, mix it with buttermilk and uh, pour it on your boulders. Um, when the temperature drops, you're going to start to see that the buttermilk will grow uh, lots of beautiful mosses and attract uh, some lovely um, uh, lichens and such to give that rock some character. Real simple. So this was a real interesting project. It's over in the East Bay. <clears throat> There's homes behind this home. Everything drains down to this house. This sidewalk to the right, was a river when it rained, as well as this site here. So my good friend um, designed this landscape. She brought in a lot of boulders. She terraformed this to a brand new shape, <laughs> set the rock in such a way that it's going to slow down the water or stop it. She put in low areas where the plants are gonna sit so that the low areas would um, catch the water and keep them on site. So she redirected water essentially with this particular landscape. You can just see the boulder work here. Beautifully done. She, she really knows how to set rock. You can see the terraforming that she did. That hole in the back, there's gonna be a big tree going in there. I'll show you that in a minute. This is her company. This is Mission Blue. She's the one that did all of this work. She was a former student of mine. Uh, I taught at Merit for a time. Brought in a large tree. Set that house down in the landscape. And this is what it looked like on almost completion. Drip system went in. It's all terraformed. Water is coming into the landscape now and, and not being wasted as they do in nature. You can see water moving in nature all the time using boulders and terraforming. So let's talk about the works. How about that? That was all lawn. Can you imagine what that looked like before? Well, I'm gonna show you. This is what it looked like before on the left. And this is what they did with it on the right. 
removed all this garbage, um, brought in some decent soil amendments. This wall was um, uh, just wrong. So they um, terraced it out, brought in some boulders, put in some landscape lighting. It looks like they're existing. Much better look. Established a rain swale in here so that the rain uh, is being caught and moved through the landscape instead of um, dumping into the gutter. Great choice of plant material here. This is what the landscape looks like now. This hell strip, they took out all the lawn in this hell strip. They put in a nice uh, place where people getting out of their cars could step. <clears throat> uh, took out that ugly wall here on this on this side and uh, terraformed it so that it had some structure, brought in some boulders to give it uh, some pizzazz. Stunning work. Let's talk about some low water plantings. This, of course, is an example of a good low water planting. People have this misconception that low water plantings look ugly, and they really don't. And I'm going to show you a number of plants um, coming up um, that you'll be able to write down names and, and, um, and get them for your own landscapes. So this is Euphorbia, Euphorbia cherryoctus. Uh, this is a great plant. It is tough. It is, uh, it's called gopher spurge because gophers don't like it. If you plant this in and around a landscape that has gophers, they will not pass this plant. And I wanna show you a before and after. So this is a before. There's the after. Before and after. When we talk about return of investment in landscapes, Forbes did an article on return of investments in landscapes and a um, quality landscape that was done correct will give you 107% return of your investment. A bathroom by comparison will only give you 40%. A kitchen will only give you 61%. A properly installed landscape will give you a 107% return of investment. The psychological curb appeal, if you're flipping houses between this and this is significant. Same chunk of, of um, landscape, big difference. Beautiful stonework. And this stuff's not that hard to do. Terraced it out, bring it, brought in some Cortan steel to give it some levels. Beautiful entranceway. This or this. This is uh, take it out. This is day one when the new plant material went um, uh, went in. All the spray heads were capped. They were retrofitted to a drip system. It's a simple design. The boulders add interest. Uh, the grasses are tough. This These grasses down here, this is deer grass. They take reflected heat off this blacktop. They get large um, and they um, get, will give this landscape a lot of uh, interest. This with all that lawn and it just, just looks messy to this. Even planted a dog for him so that it brought interest into this landscape. Small beds. The uh, plants are exotic. This is Euphorbia again. Here's Juncus patens. This is a um, thistle. And then of course some vines on the wall to give it, give it even more interest. So this is a boring front lawn. It was um, um, 
the kids sat on this lawn once. And so the homeowners decided it's time for this to come out. This is one year later. They planted natives, Mediterraneans, mounded it. They flipped the lawn over. They sheet mulched it. They brought in compost, boulders, um, and some very interesting low-maintenance Mediterranean plants. Yeah, there are a few high-maintenance plants in here. Here's a Japanese maple up against the house, but they wanted one. Same house. Full of color. This is verbena. This is verbena lilacina de la mina. Echium faciosum. California poppies. Um, this particular plant is in Celia. Oops, didn't mean to do that. And Celia Californica. There's some iris in here. This is uh, uh, the California um, iris de Glossiana. Same house. This is one year later. This is another house, rather boring. This is what they turned it into. Rather boring, got rid of the lawn, <clears throat> picked up this downspout here on the right side of the house, dumped the water into this swale. This swale uh, allows the water to percolate and irrigate these plants. And so that the water stays on site. <clears throat> Brought a lot of interest to this landscape. It was a simple fix. Here's another one. Lawn. Can't even find the front door on this one. Brought in some plant material. Boulders. Terraformed it. Seven months later. Backyard. Did the same thing, removed all the lawn, and then um, put in a um, um, flagstone and interplanted it with creeping thyme. Real simple stuff. Why not veggies? Why not? Would you rather have this or a lawn? Can't eat a lawn. Lawn to veggies. It works. You can't eat your lawn. Freedom Lawns. This is a website. You can go to a website and it'll tell you about all the bulbs that you can plant in your lawn and never mow it or irrigate it again. This particular uh, uh, person put in tulips. This one overseeded with wild, wildflowers, just got to Larner's Seeds and ordered a number of different wildflowers, followed the directions on the package of the, of the seeds, and this is what, what resulted. You can still see a little patch of lawn to the right. This is non-irrigated. Achillea. So I want to talk about some California natives that will work in landscapes. Let's see, how am I doing on time? Oh, I'm pretty good. I'm actually ahead of myself. And um, a lot of people think that uh, uh, California natives are ugly. They see a, a landscape that's been installed in natives. The big issue with California natives is a lot of um, the typical gardeners that are out there don't know how to manage natives. They don't know how to prune them. They don't know how to install them. They uh, use fertilizer and California natives do not like any fertilizer. They don't know how to irrigate them. They don't know how to prune them. And so a typical native landscape usually disappears if it has poor maintenance within uh, three years. And it's all based on poor maintenance. So I want to show you a number of different plants that will work in um, a low or or no water landscape that are stunning. This is Clarkia. It stays low. It's about a foot, foot and a half. 
Um, it is a great plant. Uh, comes in various colors. It's easy to grow. It doesn't need a lot of water. Origeron glaucus. This is uh, a sunny area with water. It's small. It's uh, under uh, about 12 inches. It's uh, a really nice ground cover, Origeron glaucus. This happens to be the variety Wayne Roderick. Um, so you can get this in a white, which is the, the straight species of Origeron. Or you can get the Wayne Roderick, which is this particular color, color here. This is Gilia, Gilia capitata, uh, this beautiful flower head. Uh, another easy one to grow. <clears throat> and it is uh, quite drought tolerant. PCH, or the Pacific Coast Hybrids. Um, so there are 11 varieties of um, iris native to California, and the um, growers decided to hybridize them. So you can get a mix called PCH or Pacific Coast Hybrid native iris. You can get the individual colors uh, of the uh, 11. If you buy the individual colors, they'll charge you more because they're, uh, they're, they have to segregate them out. They're going to charge you less with the Pacific uh, coast hybrids. The, um, the native irises um, do, do quite well in our area. Obviously, they're natives. They're very colorful. Uh, minor, uh, I have a number of these in my backyard, and they're blooming right now. Um, the pollinators just go nuts for them. Uh, it's a great a pollinator plant. It is a beautiful tuck-in plant, and it is easy to grow. Trick with PCHs, don't irrigate in the summer. It will rot them out. So um, don't irrigate them in the summertime. Uh, irrigate everything around them if you need to, but don't uh, water your irises. Lupins. Lupins are um, uh, attracting um, a lot of different kinds of butterflies, a lot of pollinators. There's a number of different colors. There's uh, Lupinus bicolor. There's Lupinus arbor, um, arboreus. There's a bunch of them. You can get seed for this and uh, overseed an area, and you don't have to buy these as a plant. They do um, uh, seed very easily. Larner's seeds, again, is a really good choice for uh, getting lupins. Um, quite nice, um, about uh, 12 to 18 inches tall, lots of flowers, beautiful leaf. Uh, you, can't, you can't beat uh, lupins for uh, uh, color and that uh, stunning texture. This is mimulus. Now, this is a plant that needs a little bit more water than what I've shown you. If you've got an area that is somewhat shady and it's a little on the wet side, maybe near a downspout or um, um, where the water has a tendency to pool. This one will work. Um, uh, this one is um, a beautiful plant, uh, Mimulus guttatus. There's a couple of Mimulus I'm going to show you tonight. Uh, this is sticky monkey flower. First peoples used to use these as band-aids because the um, leaves will stick to your skin. So mild abrasions, they used to put a, the leaf over that. Uh, to keep the uh, bacteria out. This is Cicerinchium californicum. This is a uh, uh, full sun. This is, uh, I'm going to show you another one called Cicerinchium bellum. This one's yellow. Cicerinchium bellum is, is blue. I'll show you those in just a minute. These are easy to grow. Um, they spread by rhizomes. They're not thuggish at all. They're blooming right now. Um, they usually start blooming once the rains uh, begin to slow down. Um, they're a low growing plant, about six inches, and they're really good for a border. This is the Oregon grape. It is a, a California native, and yes, it does have a grape uh, like um, fruit. The leaves are dark and leathery. leathery. This is a really tough plant. 
It's easy to grow. There are a number of Berberus that are on the market. This happens to be Aquifolium. There's Navinii. There's a bunch of Berberus out there. Um, so they're well worth looking into. You can get them uh, 12 inches up to 36 inches, a little bit more on some, but 36 is usually your, your cap on height on these. Gets a beautiful uh, yellow flower. The uh, roots on this particular plant are yellow. Uh, so they're really quite interesting when you pull them out of the can and you see those yellow roots. This is spice bush, six feet by six feet. Although you can keep it around four feet if you like. They call it spice bush because the uh, flowers and the leaves have a, have a particular scent to them. The flowers have a um, um, somewhat of a spicy scent. The leaves, um, when you crush them, it depends on your sniffer. Some people smell old newspapers. Some people find um, that they're smelling wine that's been left out overnight. Others um, smell alm almonds. So it depends on your snifter. But this particular uh, plant is uh, really easy to grow. It's tough. It's drought tolerant. The leaves are beautiful. The flowers themselves are about two and a half to three inches. And this plant is covered with them. Uh, right around May, the flowers start coming out. Oh. This is Carpenteria. Um, this is the California Camellia. Another stunning plant. Um, easy to grow. About um, two and a half feet tall uh, by about two and a half feet wide. Um, it's blooming right now. Um, it's a beautiful show. And this is another easy one to grow in a drought tolerant garden. Cercis occidentalis or the Western redbud. So this is a plant that has four season interests. In the spring, you get these gorgeous flowers. And I mean, this plant is covered with them. And then um, as the weather warms up, these stunning leaves, reniform or kidney-shaped leaves come out. And you get that through the summer. You get fall color, reds and oranges on the leaves. <clears throat> the um, flowers turn into pea pods. So in the wintertime, your plant is covered with these pea pods that rattle in the wind. It's a great plant. This is a four season interest plant, tough, drought tolerant, gets 15 feet, uh, more or less. It's not a huge tree. <clears throat> this is a showstopper in a landscape. This is Galvisia speciosum. They call it the lipstick plant. And it is a low grower um, covered with these uh, reddish um, flowers. Usually about uh, June, the flowers begin to come out. Um, tough plant, uh, 18 inches tall, and it's easy to grow. Ramnus californica. This one's going through a name change right now. Um, this is coffee berry. The species of this one will get about eight feet tall. So if you've got a fence line that you're trying to cover, this is a, uh, a no brainer for a fence line. There is also a little growing one called Mound San Bruno. Stays about three feet tall. It's a gorgeous little plant. Gets the berries, gets the flowers. Tough, tough, tough plant. Um, the birds like the berries, the birds like the flowers. You get a lot of pollinators on this particular plant. Um, so the big one is um, is great for a fence line if you're looking for some foundation plants. And then the small one, the Ramnus californica Mount San Bruno, is a great plant for accent use. It looks uh, great around boulders. Um, and it is a real good foil to bounce silver colors, uh, other kinds of colors off um, the, the plant. Um, lighter greens, and your flowers. Ribes arium, um, or the uh, currant. Um, 
Uh, I'm going to show you a couple of different ribes. Uh, ribes aureum usually uh, begins blooming early. It's usually out about March, and then it gets these um, little raisin-like fruit that are edible. They have a big seed in, so they're not really that great, but the birds seem to like them. And this is a, an easy plant to go uh, to grow. It's tough. It doesn't need to be irrigated. Um, and it's just covered with these uh, yellow flowers, um, usually about March, February, March is when this one comes out. This is its cousin, Ribes sanguinium. You can get this in red, pink, and white. It has um, uh, uh, a cultivar called white icicles, which looks just like that. Look at this leaf. This leaf is just beautiful. It's a maple-like leaf. Um, this one does under trees quite well. If you've got a somewhat of a, a, a dappled shady area, this is the, the plant of choice, whereas its cousin is in the full sun, Ribes aureum. <coughs> uh, Trichostoma lanatum. This is woolly blue curls. This plant hates everything. It does not like fertilizer. It does not like to be fussed with. It does not like to be irrigated. It doesn't want any soil amendments. It'll appreciate being planted near a boulder. Um, it's a long-lived plant. The leaves, when you crush them, smell like pine. Um, the hummingbirds go crazy for this particular plant, as do the pollinators. This is a great plant for a... Um, real hot hillside. It'll take the heat. Once it's established, it does quite well. A trick when you're planting this one, plant it and then drown it. I mean, I'm serious. Just water this thing. Uh, I mean, overwater this thing. And this particular plant will appreciate you doing that. And then once it's established, no water at all. Uh, cut it off completely. Long-lived plants, these plants will, will live 15, 20 years easily if you don't fuss uh, with this particular plant. It likes to be neglected, but it gives a lot. The, the flowers are stunning. They're soft. Uh, they feel like, um, like a lamb's ears, um, and the color is beautiful. You can see these extended stamens here at the top uh, on this particular plant. So this is a great um, lawn substitute plant. This is Lonacera. Um, nice little plant, drought tolerant, tough plant. Um, gets a yellow flower with these extended stamens. And as, this is the sugar bush. So there's two types of Roos that I highly recommend. This is Roos ovata, and the other one is Roos integrifolia. This one is called sugar bus, and the other one is called lemonade berry. The lemonade berry, when you get the, the seeds, um, if you pop them in your mouth, uh, they taste like lemons. This one, uh, if you pop these in your mouth, it's sweet. It's, and that's why they call it a sugar bus. So it's, uh, this is just before it blooms. Um, it will get about six feet tall. It's a very good foundation plant. I have two in my garden. They're right behind me, as a matter of fact. I have a meditation garden, and I have two of them that are in my meditation garden. Um, easy care. I don't do anything with them. Um, they might get watered four or five times a year, maybe. I prune them once a year just to keep them in shape. That's about it. Very low maintenance. Uh, gives you some beautiful flowers. The pollinators like the flowers. They'll visit this particular plant all, all day long. Arctostophilus. So you want something eight inches tall. You want something 15 feet tall. Pick a manzanita. Manzanitas are easy to grow. They're tough. Um, you want to pick the plant that fits the space. Um, these don't like to be pruned. They get what's called twig dieback, as as do ceanothus. I'll talk about that in just a minute. But you want to pick the plant for the space. So if you've got a space that's only four feet by four feet, 
then pick a manzanita that's going to fit into that space so you don't have to prune it. <coughs> the lower growing manzanitas need to be watered seven or eight times during the summer, um, but the taller ones don't. Um, interesting fact about the taller uh, manzanitas is that they have that beautiful uh, reddish bark. In the heat of the summer, if you put your hand on that bark, it's ice cold. So when the natives, uh, first people were out hunting, if they came upon a manzanita, they used to put their neck up against the um, bark of the manzanita to cool the blood going to their brain, which would cool them down when they were out uh, hunting. So Arctostaphylis or manzanita, manzanita means little apple. This is a great plant to feed the hummingbirds in the wintertime. This one blooms in um, November, December into January. And that's when the pollinators uh, need uh, help. Hummingbirds are still out in our area. A lot of the native bees are still foraging. So this is a great plant to put in uh, the garden for them. This is Bacarus pillularis. It's a low grower, 18 to 24 inches tall, tough as nails. You've got a hillside that um, is difficult to plant. This one will, will do it. Full sun, the hotter the better. It takes um, um, about six months before this one is acclimated. So you're going to have to irrigate a couple of times a week to get this one uh, started. But once it's uh, started, it uh, it's tough. Once a year, you cut it uh, in half and uh, it produces these beautiful green leaves. And then, of course, the flowers and the stunning uh, um, uh, seeds. Ceanothus, again, pick the ceanothus to fit the space. And don't pick it by color. This is a plant that gets twig dieback. If you prune it, it's going to die back. So this is one that you don't want to prune. If you've got a four by four space, get a ceanothus that's going to fill a four by four. Don't buy a ceanothus that's going to go out of control at eight feet by eight feet because it's going to cause you no end of misery. And you're going to, you're going to say, oh, I hate ceanothus. They don't work. Well, no, they do work if you know how to choose them. Um, colors, um, denim blues, whites. There's even a ceanothus that is a vine. There's an outstanding book out there on ceanothus. It's uh, written by David Frost. Um, if you're looking for more information on ceanothus, I highly recommend that book. Um, of course, these are California natives. They are a, a great plant, um, easy to grow, just as long as you don't prune them. Aragonium gigantium and its cousin, Aragonium grande. This is St. Catherine's Lace, covered with these flowers in June and July. The flowers are great um, uh, as a dried flower. Take them in the house. Um, in flower arrangements, they work quite well. And then, of course, it's um, cousin, the Aragonium Grande. And this happens to be a ruby uh, pink, uh, pink flower. Great plant. Same thing. The flowers dry beautifully. They get about 30 inches tall, both of them. Um, the St. Catherine's Lace has a tendency to get a little bit bigger, three feet maybe. This one, about 30 inches. Stunning foundation plants, good accent plants. Pollinators go crazy for these things, as do the hummingbirds. Penstem and heterophyllus. This happens to be Margarita Bop, uh, and it's um, written B period, O period, P period. The grower found this on his back porch. So he named it after his wife, Margarita, and he put back of porch. That's what Margarita Bop means, back of porch. This is a long lived plant, 50 years, easily 50 years, as long as you don't mess with it. I have seven of these in my uh, garden in the backyard. It's been blooming for 
Oh, about four weeks now, maybe five, and it'll bloom all the way into uh, October, November. It'll slow down a little bit in the um, winter time, but not by much. About 18 inches tall. It's a great accent plant. Works well with iris. Works well with succulents. So if you want to do a succulent garden uh, mixed with California natives, that's what I've got in my backyard. I've got succulents and then California natives. Uh, and it's a beautiful combination. Great plant. There's a lot of colors on this one. There's whites, there's pinks, there's reds. Um, so look up pen stem and heterophyllus and look at all of the color choices that you have with this particular plant. Once it's established, it's uh, very drought tolerant. It stays um, uh, about 18 inches and it likes a dry, sunny area. Anything salvia, plant it. You can't go wrong. This happens to be leucophylla. These particular flowers are um, the the botanical, the correct botanical name for these flowers are silicasters. And of course, the hummingbirds and the pollinators go nuts for these things. Um, these uh, flowers come up about 18 inches, but salvia, the plant itself usually stays about three feet, dry, sunny area again. Um, and then this is the cousin to Cicerinchium californicum. This is Cicerinchium bellum. I have these in my front garden. My front garden is uh, south facing. I don't do anything to these things, nothing. Um, I've had them in, in my front garden 20 years. I haven't done a thing to these things, nothing. They, uh, they disappear in the wintertime when it gets cold. And then in the spring, right around February, all of a sudden, they're there. Um, great plant. They spread by rhizomes. They're not, they're not even close to being thuggish. They're, they're just easy to grow. I like saying this plant. This is Zauschneria. Sounds like it should be German of some sort. I don't know. But this is Zauschneria californica. Um, uh, great plant. There's a smaller one called Catalina. That's about mm, about a foot tall. The straight species is about eighteen. Um, can hit twenty four inches. Beautiful uh, flowers, extended stamens. Again, hummingbirds and bees go nuts for this. Uh, dry sunny area. Again, uh, tough plant, and real easy to grow. Dendromicon. This one brings in a lot of beneficial. Insects. The insect you see on this one is a surfeit fly. Um, again, um, uh, dry, sunny area. The plant itself gets four to eight feet tall. And then around July and August produces these stunning, stunning um, yellow flowers. It's just covered with them. Onothera, um, another um, tall plant, four to eight feet tall, dry, sunny area. Um, easy to grow. This is called a fried egg plant. Not sure why. Uh, Romnia culturae uh, will get four to eight feet, dry, sunny area. So you need to love this plant if you're going to put it in your garden because it will eat up a lot of real estate. Once it's in, it's in. Um, you're going to play hell trying to take this thing out if you don't like it. It spreads like crazy. You see this one on 280. It blooms uh, right around July and August. So if you're cruising down 280 and you see a white flower that looks like this, it's Romnia culturae. They put it up on 280 for a reason. It's tough. It doesn't need any water. It's stunning when it begins to bloom. Uh, again, four to eight feet tall, usually around six, five or six feet is a max you're going to get on this. Another salvia, um, this one will go four feet by six feet, covered with these flowers. As I said, anything salvia, just plant it. You can't go wrong with salvia. Uh, dry, sunny area, again. This is Aescalus californica, which is the California buckeye. Uh, it's a tree, 18 feet tall, easy to grow. Um, Dry, sunny area. 
<clears throat> it loses its leaves in August. It's uh, it's um, obligate dormant, uh, which means it has to lose its leaves. No matter how much water you're going to give this thing, it's going to lose its leaves in, in August. So if you don't mind that, um, this is a great tree to put in any landscape. The branch structure, when it loses its leaves, is stunning. There's one up at Striving in the native garden that is outstanding. It is gorgeous. Um, so if you're into uh, branch patterns and, and uh, such, this is your choice. Tough as nails, doesn't need any water. Um, this one, again, is up on 280. It's mixed in with the Romnia. And uh, you'll see both of these blooming uh, at the same time, usually May, June, depending on weather. This is the California strawberry, Arbutus menzies eye, um, 12 feet tall, um, dry, sunny area. Once it establishes, it gets these beautiful white flowers, and then it gets a strawberry-like fruit that is edible, but it's sour. Uh, but this is a great choice. Fremontodendron. Um, this particular plant... <clears throat> will go 12 feet tall and it'll be just a wall of yellow. Um, these are short-lived plants. You're going to get about eight years out of this particular plant, but it reseeds readily. So if you need a showstopper plant, Remontodendron is, is your uh, choice. There's um, smaller varieties, uh, about four feet tall. You can get some of the cultivars that will stay around uh, four feet. There's one called Yankee. Great plant. This is Aqualesia. This is a tuck-in plant. It's small. It's about 18 inches tall. It's columbine. Um, the bees can't figure out how to get in this way, so they cut the, the uh, nubs off the back, and they come in through the back door to pollinate this particular plant. So this is a tuck-in plant. This is another tuck-in plant. Um, this is Dicentra. Um, this is a shady plant. It likes a little bit of shade. Does quite well under trees. Um, doesn't need a lot of water uh, once it's established, but uh, does quite well with the with the rainy. This is the California huckleberry. It has a reddish stem. It has an edible fruit. Um, this is one of the few natives that you can hedge. So if you've got um, High maintenance boxwood, uh, replace it with Vicinium ovatum and you'll have a low maintenance uh, plant that you can hedge. Aristolochia californica, this is a vine. Um, you got to have some space for this thing. Um, it will easily travel 80 feet. Um, if it has something to grab, it's going to grab it and grow on it. If you've got a cyclone fence, this is a perfect solution for a cyclone fence. This one gets a uh, butterfly uh, called the uh, uh, called um, uh, the pipe vine butterfly. It's a beautiful bluish butterfly. So if you're looking to get an unusual butterfly in your garden, Aristolochia. There's a big one up at Striving in the native garden, and if you go there just about now, you're going to see a lot of larvae for the butterfly, and you'll start to see some of the butterflies hatching out, but it's a little bit early for them to hatch out. They're, the larvae are around, they're eating this vine like crazy, and then they're going to pupate and come out as a stunning butterfly. Heteromelies are beautifolia, or the Christmas berry. The berries come out around Christmas uh, time. They're red. Uh, this is the plant where the birds go in there and eat it and um, uh, get uh, drunk. Uh, it'll work in a shady area. It'll work in a sunny area. It works in a parking lot. It's a tough plant. Um, gets uh, about 12 feet tall, but it's prunable. It doesn't mind being pruned. This is Prunus alicifolia and its cousin, Prunus lioni. You can see the leaf on this one is much softer. The leaf on this one is much more... Um, poly like and rugged. Um, this is a great plant if you're dealing with uh, oak root fungus problems. These are immune to oak root fungus. <clears throat> they can get big, 
If you let them, you can prune them down to six to eight feet. If you go down to Gamble Garden in um, Palo Alto on uh, Waverly and Embarcadero, the perimeter is ringed with Prunus alicifolia and Prunus lioni. They keep them um, pruned at about four feet. They get a, a spike-like flower, typical of a um, Prunus species plant. <clears throat> if you hike, this is the plant that you smell when you're out hiking in and around natives. This is Artemisia californica. Um, it has a curry-like scent. Once you smell this plant, you'll never forget it. Um, it's a great plant, very tough, silver. It has two types of leaf. It has a um, succulent leaf in the wintertime to take advantage of the rain. And then it, um, it changes its leaf type to this type which is a lot less exposure to the sun. Um, it is a dry sun plant, dry shade plant, tough as nails um, and easy to grow. Silver, beautiful silver, bounce green plants off it all day long. This is shooting star, uh, another tuck in plant. So this is build your garden and then just put in your tuck ins. About 18 inches tall, um, flowers come out around May. This is Mimulus orontiacus. This is another sticky monkey flower. It likes to be in dry shade. It stays about 18 inches tall and spreads, mm, not very thuggish, but it will spread out and eat up some real estate. A uh, gorgeous plant. There's a, one called Jelly Bean that is a little bit different color than this one. There's a couple of different cultivars of this. This is Holodiscus or Ocean Spray. This one smells like old newspapers. You usually smell this one before you see it. It likes dry shade. It um, In uh, native cultures, it does quite well under redwood trees. Four to eight feet tall and covered with these um, flowers. Um, easy to grow. Lepicinia. This is the Wallace's uh, pitcher plant. It looks like and smells like a sage. Another very tough plant, four feet tall, covered with these uh, uh, these um, nodding flowers. Um, just a, a great plant to uh, replace your lawn with. This is another ribes. They call this the ballerina plant. This one gets thorns but it does produce these uh, stunning flowers and then it produces a raisin-like fruit. This is one of the few plants uh, in the world that gets a white berry. This is a snowberry, Symphiocarpus uh, rivularis. Um, about six feet tall, likes to be under trees. Will even grow under eucalyptus, believe it or not. I have one more slide, or is that it? Ah, yeah, one more. So this is Gary elliptica, silk tassel, and it is a great plant for a hot area. There's a smaller one called Eve Case that does quite well also. So one of the reasons that you want to plant a lot of these plants is because of the sustainability. Sustainability is not a fad. Um, these plants do in uh, California because that's where they were born. And that's why you want to replace your lawns with them. So I hope I've given you some choices. Hope I've given you some different kinds of looks and landscapes so that you can take your space and turn it into a gem. There you go. All right, virtual round of applause. Thank you, Frank. That was very informative and perfect timing with your slides. We do have a few questions. Um, feel free to ask some more in the Q&A or raise your hand and I can unmute you. But why don't we start with um, some that we already have. So the first question is, a naturalist once showed me a plant with purple flowering clusters that native Indians used for soap, the can washing. Do you know what the name of this plant is and where it can be purchased? Soap plant, believe it or not, or chlorogulum. 
And you can purchase this at uh, Yerba Buena in Half Moon Bay. Most nurseries carry it. Uh, you might have to special order it. Annie's Annuals over in Richmond sometimes has it. Um, uh, but yeah, um, um, uh, there's a guy by the name of Glenn Keeter who is an expert on natives. And uh, when I was a young horticulturist, I went on a hike. Me and a whole bunch of other people went on a hike with this guy. And we got back to his house and he took off his boots and he handed us his socks and he had us wash his socks <laughs> with <laughs> soap plant. Yeah, it's true. Oh, story. with the soap plant. <laughs> uh, uh, he just wanted to make a point. That's Glenn. Um, do you buy seeds? Uh, what is, uh, um, Larner's is the best place to buy seeds. Um, the native uh, varieties at the nursery um, are... Um, Sometimes they have them, sometimes they don't, but Larner Seeds up north has them. Um, Judith um, Larner Lowry is her name. She wrote a book that's quite famous, but uh, I would buy seeds from them. There's a number of specialty seed companies out there. There's Telos, um, Rare Seeds and Bulbs. Um, so yeah, there's, um, there's um, a number of different seed nurseries where you can get this stuff. What do I think about Nana Ruscia to replace grass? Not, don't know that plant. Nana. Anybody know this plant? Help me out here. No. It's star carpet. Star carpet. I don't know that one. Or cor carpet of stars. Don't know it. You stump me on that one. You get the prize. <laughs> Uh, Lisa, do you need to deadhead these natives? Well, there's two schools of thought. You can deadhead them, or you can allow them to set seeds so the birds can get them. So some people want a neater garden, so they deadhead. Others allow the plants to go to seed. The birds pick up a lot of those seeds, and um, you'll get more plants if you allow those seeds to... Um, to um, um, just fly around the garden. Um, mulberry trees, um, they're nice. I like them. They're not a great uh, plant for a garden. They do take some maintenance. Uh, you do get a worm on them now and again. It's a silkworm. Uh, it's an okay plant. Uh, informative session, anonymous attendee. Anonymous, thank you very much. Uh, you mentioned starting sheep mulching in June and July. Um, yeah, so the timeline, so there's a couple of different timelines. You can sheep mulch in the fall with the idea that you're going to plant early spring. So we're along about September, you uh, sheep mulch and you're going to plant in early spring. You can also sheet mulch in June and July with the idea that you're going to plant in September, October, November. So the timeline is don't remove your lawn. Lay out cardboard and you want to put in um, about six inches of mulch right on top of that cardboard. And let the soil organisms eat the cardboard because they will and they'll also eat your lawn. Um, they'll convert it into food and, and it will give you some amazing soil. Along the edges where you have a sidewalk, you're going to get plants that are going to come bumping out um, because you can't sheet mulch over that sidewalk. So what I do is I fill a, a sprayer up with vinegar and soap, uh, a tablespoon of dishwashing soap, and I spray those with vinegar. Vinegar is acetic acid. It burns the cells of the grass plant and usually knocks them down. Don't use Roundup. Uh, Roundup is overrated. If you if you want a really good organic um, spray, you can use Eco Exempt or Phenolsin. Uh, those are the two best ones in the um, in the arsenal right now. Um, you can also get forty five percent vinegar. Um, be careful with that one if you're going to use vinegar. It's acetic acid. It's 45%. Wear a mask. Wear gloves. Don't get the stuff on your skin. It kills weeds in less than two hours. I mean, this stuff is strong. 
Um, I have it. I use it. I like it. It's cheap. Amazon sells it to you for 29 bucks a quart. It's oh, way you gotta be cool. careful with that, huh? Yeah, well, it's great stuff. Just you know, read the um SDS sheet on that one. Uh would think that they uh, grow let's see. Um uh, I think this is referring to the California natives about um dead lawning or deadheading. Yeah, um Certain of the natives don't like to be cut back. Others do. It's, um, uh, do I have her book? I do. No. But, uh, there's a book by Helen Popper that is a 12 month. Uh, how to take care of your natives. Uh, she, she's uh, associated with the um, Santa Clara um, Native Plant Society. You can go to Amazon or you order the book through the um, Native Plant Society in Santa Clara. Uh, and it will tell you when to cut back. There's also a great book by Cass Turnbull on pruning. She does have some natives in there but not as comprehensive comprehensive as Helen Popper's book. Looks like small green stars. I, I don't, I've i never seen Nana Ruscia. You guys are stumping me on that one. Can oh, you, is, that, is that the plant? Yeah, it looks like tiny little succulents. Yeah, I just don't know that one. Yeah, I mean, if it's a succulent, it should should do well. Succulents are pretty tough in our area. I wouldn't put it near a wildlife area because sometimes these things can break loose. Uh, dwarf tall fescue, a good lawn grass? Yes, it is. If you go to Delta Bluegrass's website, you're going to see a lot of the, the tougher grasses that are out there. Um, they have um, a, um, a fescue that is called a bolero mix. And it has twenty percent bluegrass and ten uh, and nine uh, eighty percent. Let's see, ten percent blue and ninety percent fescue. They also have an eighty twenty. So Delta Bluegrass has some great um, uh, stuff. They also have a native mix that's uh, really attractive. Um, they also have the native bent grass that's really tough. So go to Delta Bluegrass's website. They're up in Stockton. Um, and, um, yeah, would love to see pics of your garden in bloom. Yeah, I could probably do that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Frank. We're out of time. So we'll call it a night, but this uh, session was recorded and will be posted on YouTube, um, ACW's website and a link to that will be sent out to all participants. So thank oh. you all for joining us. And, uh, thank you, Frank. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your evening. Yep. Good night, everybody. Bye.